All right, we're back, and uh, we've got Typhon Blue on the line again. I'm just going to call Typhon back up onto live. Typhon, you're, you're on. Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yep. I can. Welcome back to the show. Thanks. Actually, I wanted to, to thank Karen for the plug under uh, with her last video, although it seems I've, everybody's I've reading it. before, thing. actually, so. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, your inflatable femme post. Oh, <laughs> that that gave yeah, me that a lot good. of ideas, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, you are a thinker. Holy crap! So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, you. I'm also going to be uh, promoting um, your videos, Type and Blue, because you haven't done a lot of them, uh, and I think they're important. I think it's important to get that stuff out there. So uh, if anybody is subscribed to the JTO channel, they will be seeing me promote Type and Blue increasingly in the future, um, because. Where do you think I steal all my ideas from? <laughs> yeah, we all we all get oh, them from you. Oh, it was you, was it? <laughs> we get them from you. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, again, again, thanks for thanks for the plug. Although, I I I regret putting a transcript up because I noticed that I think everybody's reading the transcript and not actually watching the video, which makes me wonder why I put a video up. <laughs> everybody well, reads the transcripts. I, I have a lot of demands for transcripts, um, to put up transcripts of my videos, and, and I just I keep putting it off. Um, but I suppose well, it's, it's a lot of work. Well, it's a lot I of work. Script, I script my videos, though, so, I mean, there's only some small amendments that I would have to make, and then I could throw mm -hmm. them up. But, but uh, it's, I don't know, it's just one of those kind of things in the pile of things to do that. Yeah, know. there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's but, quite a few. <laughs> So, um, and then when I whenever yeah. I think, oh, I should do that, then I have a, an idea for another video. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, I think okay, it's more important that you post your videos and transcripts anyway. I don't I've mind watching a lot we've more. Got, a lot more. We've got another caller on the line. We've got another caller on the line, Mark, who's been waiting very patiently, and I'm going to bring Mark. This is not Marky Mark; it's a different Mark. Um, welcome to the show. Hi, this is Mark. Hi. Hey, how are you? Hey, uh, so, so I wanted to call in. Uh, I live in an apartment complex, and uh, you always hear this couple down below me. They're getting in fights all the time, right? And uh, what happened recently was uh, apparently she socked him in the face, and uh, then she, like, overdosed. She took a bunch of pills and went out in the parking lot and collapsed. And then the ambulance took her away, and I guess apparently what happened later was she actually got charged uh, with domestic violence. So that, I was just thinking that that's like some progress uh, that's being made kind of in the men's rights uh, movement. But, you know, at least they charged her with a crime. And, it, it uh, is yeah, actually that's, that's starting what I was to be about. more likely that that will happen, yeah. Yeah. Um, a little bit, yeah. Well, she wasn't, but anyway, that was she was not sufficiently calculating in her, in her attack on him. Probably if she hadn't dosed herself and passed out in public, uh, she might have been able to manipulate the situation into getting him arrested. But I, I, even given the, the circumstances, I'm glad to see that there is some policing being done that is not by script, that is actually judgment being exercised by police officers in such an instance. Right. She kind of made herself into a victim at the end, you know? But, I mean, they still yeah. did something, so that's better than nothing, you know? Well, that's well, that's not the really amazing um, thing is that in in the, in even outside of what I do uh, online, just in real life, I've only ever known one battered woman, and I've known three battered men. Right. Yeah. I yeah. I can. We just I can need more uh, men's rights lawyers. We really need more like men going their own way type people to become lawyers because of the feminists. Apparently have like an army of lawyers, definitely divorce lawyers. So I think that's oh, a key point to like make progress. One thing that I would, I wish a lot, uh, a lot more men would try and just sort of suck it up and swallow the grief for you know however many years it takes to actually do psychology in university. Because <laughs> one thing that that's really lacking is is men in psychology and men who know anything about who haven't been feminized who who approach men's problems from a male perspective rather than from a, a feminist perspective. So, um, well, I, yeah, I, know, I know one 
Darren, I'll say I know one individual who is uh, pursuing that course um, as a as a not necessarily as a career path, but just as a self education path. Um, and uh, that and that individual is about the most red pill person I know, besides Paul. Well, I think you would have to be to be able to get through uh, a humanities program like that, or a sociology, anything like that, um, with your brain intact. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or what, what's left of it, yeah. Yeah, because... Uh, Freud, um, Freud was labeled a misogynist, um, but I mean, a lot of the early psychologists were male, but then now I think it seems like more and more being female. Oh, it's 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 a hugely female industry right now. It's ex, it's extremely right. difficult for a man to find a male psychologist or a counselor. So, and they wonder Definitely. why men don't get treatment for depression. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're they're supposed to just suck it up, number one, and then when they make when they go through the phone book, they can't find a man to you know. Uh, well, they're supposed to suck it. it up, and then then they get insulted yeah. for sucking it up. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. almost like the shaming is the, is the point of it. Um, what what gets me is that is that right now, as far as you know, this discussion of uh, of uh, constructing masculinity and and how men are abandoning their old roles, they're they're just like turning to Xbox and beer and casual hookups, and they're not getting married, and they're not being good corporate drones, and they're not climbing the ladder, and all of that. Well, you know. You can shame somebody into dying for his country if there's a promise of respect in it, but you can't shame somebody into cutting off his own balls. <laughs> you know, well, shame Sarah, doesn't sure work to get true. to do that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I, entirely I sure that that's true, because if you look at some of the more, um, I will call them outlandish, male feminists, like oh, the, man the members... Oh, man-boobs like. <laughs> yeah, the man-boobs, well, I mean... But I'll go even farther than man moves. You remember um, Gay Arjuna and uh, and well, no, Gay Hendricks and Arjuna Ardog, which I'm pretty sure is a is a made up name, um, who created the the Dear Woman Project. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, that I swear I you know, it's not very often that I actually want to inflict violence on somebody that hasn't inflicted violence on me, but just watching that, I just wanted to jump through my computer screen and I'll show you a gentle goddess. <laughs> yeah, throttle them. You know, yeah. I throttle them out of really that really can't be be any more patronizing and condescending and, you know, oh my god. You know, there's a point at where worship becomes condescending, you know. Well, I I actually saw those that that viewpoint that they were taking. I saw it as a very opportunistic and frankly, predatory view of, of women, that they were, in fact, preying on the, the childish insecurities and the, and the childish needs and desires of an infantilized view of, of femininity, that they were taking advantage of the women that they were supposedly exalting. And I, as a man, I found, those, I found them to be repulsive. I found their, them to be completely... Uh, absolutely unappealing in every possible way, but I did not have any desire to, you know, throttle, try to throttle sense into them. I didn't have that desire to, to, to you know, grab them and try to shake sense into them. But however, every female friend of mine who I showed that video to has expressed in one way or another some desire to do violence to them. And oh, that yeah. to me is fascinating. It's, well, you know, there comes a point where uh, I think because I think a lot of women really they enjoy being treated like children because when you're treated like children you're very you feel very secure and you get lots of attention and and everybody wants to please you and and the whole bit and take care of you and and forgive you for your wrongs and all that but then when when it gets to be to that degree of just patronizing pap it it drunk yeah I just it's it's just I I didn't want to shake sense into them. I just wanted them to shut up. <laughs> shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Please stop! I, I I don't want to listen. Like I think I stopped it at about two minutes in because I couldn't I couldn't stand it anymore. 
Like, well, if you listen to Paul's version of it, Paul did. Uh, Paul actually took the script of the original one, and he didn't change the wording at all. He just took out the flowery music, and uh, read their original script in an East Texas drawl, uh, <laughs> which to me it was one of the most hilarious videos I've ever seen. <laughs> Um, and it doesn't <laughs> what have script, quite the drawing. Uh, what script are you all referring to? There's a video uh, online, probably you can find it, just search Dear Woman, and it's from uh, two male feminists who I think make their living selling um, men are bad, books, women are perfect, oh. self-help books to women. And it was the most um, self-abasing, look at me what a good man I am by crawling at your feet. It was seven or eight minutes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, but I would like to ask Typhon, uh, who's still uh, Typhon, are you still on the line with us? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have a question for Karen about that video. Um, is it is it the fact that if you know if your your vagina was detachable, the worship would go with it? Does, is that part of what makes it so excremental that video? I, you know, it's really hard to put my finger on what I found. I, it just it seemed in insulting and and just I, I don't I just wanted to barf all over myself. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like it, it's like I'm well speechless. they're worshiping they're worshiping something about you that you know you you have had no hand in creating. Um yeah. and you, you you didn't get you didn't do for yourself. It's it's just the most paralyzing crap paralyzing pap imp- yeah. imaginable. Oh, and, I, yeah. I would actually like to ask Typhon a question because I saw something in that video that I don't think has been talked about in this conversation yet. I, although they they use language that says worship and exalt and tra la la la, what I saw in in those men and I use the term loosely uh, exalting women, I saw a dishonesty, a level of um, really craven deception that they were feeding this line of of flattery to somebody one at a level that was incredibly insulting but two that seemed predatory to me like like a uh, like a predatory older man luring a child into a car by giving the child candy did, they did were women me. watching that you know what? was I, there that I sense couldn't, of predatory I couldn't actually watch too much of it Cause yeah, because it made you so ill. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was about you know a minute in. I was like, oh it gosh. Was, it, I it feel like I've been five. Those are the men. Those are the men that you think he's gonna. I'm gonna be like taking off my bra one night and I'm gonna glance at the window and there's his eyes gonna be staring in at me. <laughs> you know, well, I don't, I don't really want to go into. I don't want keeping Tom. Uh, yeah, well, I, I don't like, want to go into that. But like, it, what, it's what almost, I get from that is. What I get from that is uh, when when you when you compliment something on some uh, um, someone on something that's passive that they actually haven't done for themselves, it almost traps them in it. It traps them in that in in requiring your approval. So it creates this really toxic codependency, and that's sort of what I got off of it. And I don't know. I just I just all all I could think was. Was get away, get away, make it stop, and yeah, <laughs> no, so I, I didn't not, really eh? give it a whole lot of thought. But it just my my gut reaction was just it was just condescending. It was it was actually um, it was pretending to be worshipful, but it was actually trying to render um, femaleness or or whatever, trying to elevate it. But at the same time, it's just like we're gonna peg what this is, and that's you know it's. I'm not an icon, you know, for yeah, you to hang that. on your wall or, or offer oh, yes, things to you, or whatever, you know. you know, like. Well, Typhon, if, although you say the first one was too vomitrocious for you to listen to the whole thing, I, I do encourage you to go to Paul's uh, YouTube channel and <laughs> just do a search for Dear Woman, because he did a parody of that, which is honestly one of the funniest videos on YouTube, in my view. I'm, I'm going to have to go watch that, yeah. I, I think I did watch that. But uh, the other thing is that I found what they said to be eminently forgettable. It was I I I really don't remember a lot of what they said. <laughs> Just that it was unctuous and I didn't want to watch anymore. Yeah, it was it was pretty oily. 
Yeah. I think a lot of these uh, male feminists, um, they just, uh, you know, they think like, uh, you know, if I become a feminist supporter, it'll be a good way to meet women, you know. And, uh, you know, they'll sleep with you and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, after a while they internalize it, you know. I have the the feeling that, uh, because after, not so much after uh, uh, hearing about Dave Futrell, right, um, and and hearing people talk about him and stuff, and and going and reading some of his, his articles, but watching, like actually looking at some of the comment threads on his blog, all he he is is just desperate for female attention and approval. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. they all he, are. It's yeah, pure approval seeking. I mean, he, he's like an overweight, parents, unattractive you know? man who gets attention and approval from women by doing that. It's like at first it's your mom and dad, you try to get approval from it, and then it's your wife. You know, it's just uh, kind of a it's, uh, thing within the nuclear family, you know, that people could uh, talk about and, you know, they could change the way they think about it. Well, it's, it's I don't know, it's it's just, when, when I, and when I think about how if he ever put his foot wrong with them, they'd eat him for oh, breakfast. Oh, he'd be a dad. Oh, yeah, they just throw him out. He's a disposable man. Yeah, yeah and, and they would do it in the most humiliating way on Twitter, and they would invite Roseanne Barr to join them. Oh, yeah, so, right. I mean, look, yeah. look what happened to uh, to Tom uh, Matlock. What's his name? Tom Can Matlock. Think of the guys. Yeah, and Hugo, Tom Matlock. Hugo Schweitzer. But also, Hugo Schweitzer is who I'm thinking of, who yeah. was oh, more okay. or less torn limb from limb um, when he stepped wrong. Although I think he may have crawled and scraped enough that he won a few of his uh, <laughs> mentally impaired followers back. Um, Mark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say thanks very much for calling because I've got another Mark on the line who's been waiting most patiently. So thanks to Mark, All right, Mark for, for calling. Have a good night. All right. Thanks a lot. Hey. Mark from Austin, Hello. welcome to A Voice for Men. Hey, how you doing? You uh, Canadians are so polite. I'm just uh, – just, uh, I- Absolutely uh, overwhelmed by your politeness. I really I'm, I'm like going to have to start swearing or something then. <laughs> all three of us are too, Canadian. I wish people here uh, all three. Were, uh, was polite. I was yeah, three Canadian. I just wanted to say that uh, I take uh, all of this to a whole new level uh, that I haven't seen really anywhere online. I'm 48 years old, and I actually have a beautiful blonde. 26 year old daughter who by the way is single who by the way falls into the absolute stereotype of what you see in the news you know the uh, binge drinker uh, doing God knows what uh, has probably slept with I don't know how many men uh, completely out of control and I mean I could go on forever about she is a hazard you say that she's a hazard to herself and to others. Completely. But there was one key, very short story I just wanted to convey to you that really shines a light from a unique perspective that only someone like myself could have. One night she called me up, and she was crying her eyes out. And I said, oh, what's the matter? And uh, she told me that there was a woman at her work that had met some guy uh, was there in Fort Worth, not actually here in Austin, that was a rich business owner, and he was going to marry her, uh, sweep her off her feet, take her home. She didn't. Ha- she got the. She was going to get the quitter job, to start it, and can just start having babies from that point on. Doesn't have to work another day in her life. Well, she was the envy of all these other women, including my daughter, at her work, and uh, she says, "I just wish that I had a man to come into my life." that would be like that. And I said, well, let's examine this for a moment. This man, I'm guessing, a business owner in Fort Worth, he's very conservative, right? And she goes, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to just take a wild guess here and say that, first of all, you're going to have to start becoming a lot more respectful to men. You're going to have to stop going out every other night drinking and smoking pot or God knows what else you're doing. And here's the real punchline. I said, oh, my God you might actually have to wear a dress. And that's when her her tears uh, instantly dried up. And she uh, just absolutely out of nowhere, her voice, everything, the tone changed. And she said, fuck that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. 
Nobody. I don't answer to anybody. I do whatever I want, blah, blah, blah. Well, so there, there you, you there have it. it. Now, I, I wanna, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Um, how, she's, you say she's 27? Uh, 26, actually, yeah. 26, okay. How did, it, how did she arrive at this mentality? How did she come to have this um, Cinderella princess fantasy as an adult woman living in, the ni- in 20, 2012? Well, that was my point, is the fact that she wants a traditional, she wants the man, just like all these women, not, maybe not all of them, but a great deal of them, the majority, I would guess, to play the traditional role. While, you know, to make all the money, to take complete care of them, while they live just... Get to do whatever they want. Exactly. That's my point right there. She she encapsulated the entire conundrum, the entire problem, uh, wanting to... People say have their cake and eat it too. I say have their cake and eat everybody else's too. (laughs) <laughs> That's the way yeah. I, I word it. And uh, to be able – so they don't want to play the traditional role that a woman used to play. They don't want to have they, traditional duties and traditional obligations correct. and traditional responsibilities. No. They just want to have the traditional uh, enjoyment of, of having somebody take care of them and be devoted to them. Absolutely. And yeah, but my, she's the my product question, though, of, she's the my product question, though, of, is – yeah, I mean, it's the product of, of watching too many Disney movies or romantic comedies where Julia Roberts, the, the prostitute, gets get, becomes the wife of uh, uh, Richard Gere, the, the wonderfully chivalrous, beautifully, magnificently gorgeous, extraordinarily rich man who just comes again, forgives all of her character flaws, forgives the fact that she's a prostitute, a drug addict, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, oh, yeah. And I'm going to say a depraved, a depraved human being, that all of that doesn't matter, that somehow through magical thinking, this um, person, a woman's life choices shouldn't just, be able to, shouldn't affect her ability to attract a good, reliable man. Yeah, Absolutely the fact that not. she has proven herself to be an unreliable person, that that doesn't seem to have any impact. But how did this? Uh, 26 year old under discussion arrive at this mindset like how did she come to believe that this is a feasible picture of reality I, I you've got me I mean I that's that to me is the insanity of it all or the insanity of of all these decades of feminism and I think it's like the uh, it's coming to call the the, the bills coming in, or I don't know if that's the right expression. It's like reality is catching up with it. It's it's like women have gone so far out of control, uh, completely unaccountable to anyone, not a, accountable to employers for the most part, or to the law, to husbands, But everyone's accountable to, to them. Uh, yes, but everyone has to be accountable to them. Uh, she's not certainly not accountable to me. She doesn't listen. She doesn't have to legally listen to anything I say uh, anymore. She never really did, for that matter. But um, it's, it's, that's the problem right there, is that they want the, the man to play the traditional role. And, and of course, you, you throw on all of the laws and all of the problems, and you can end up in the poorhouse, your life wrecked from divorce, and on and on and on. It's just, I mean, it's amazing, I, I just the... Uh, sheer uh, insanity of it all. And, uh, oh, I the just level of that. risk and the level of work and the level of devotion and the level of duty and the level of cost that they want from you mm-hmm. in return for what you're going to get. Is Remember, men are the ones who are commitment phobic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the work. Well, men are the ones, men aren't commitment phobic. I, every, no, that's, that's but every man happens. that I've ever ever met wants to commit somebody. You know, oh. uh, he, they just now, Mark, women are committed. Mark, I've got one more question for you. When, when your, when this individual, when your daughter was much younger, as a child, um, was there a, a relationship between you and her, or perhaps her and her mother, where she was indulged in the princess conception of herself, where she's 
sort of the special magical person apart from normal accountability? Um, I I think not any more so than any other uh, girl. Uh, I think that every uh, young girl uh, has a princess fantasy. They're certainly fed it through Disney and and uh, you know storybooks, even the most traditional ones. I don't think that there was any level of. I, I was very, uh, I was very good to her, even though she's a product of a divorce. I, I always showed her a great deal of love. I don't know if I had any real hand in it one way or another, but the problem is maybe it could be a factor. Is that I never really had much control in her life because so I she was, was kept. Was she raised mostly by her mother? Yes, yes, and I was the typical, stereotypical divorced dad who got to come in and see her, you know, whenever. I, I admit I got to see her a little bit more than two times a month. She gradually started to come stay with me more and more, and at one point when she was a teenager, she stayed with me uh, for years, for a couple of years uh, exclusively, and uh, we we became really close, but she was – already starting to get really out of control. She would just uh, leave the uh, house uh, late at night on a school night and say, I'm leaving. And I'd say, no, you're not. And she'd say, try to stop me, and then just run out the door and slam it. She was already – I mean, that, that's a big part of it, I think. Is just, And it's pretty typical for any guy. I mean, there's nothing that I could have done – you know, she was skipping school already, you know, here and there. And uh, I, I just don't feel that I, – I feel really cheated that I didn't get to have – I don't know if it's connected to all of it, but I feel really cheated that I didn't get to really be a contribute true father. To her, yeah, contribute to her upbringing, contribute in a meaningful way. In a meaningful way. There you go. That's the word I was yeah. searching for. Yeah. yeah. So I just felt that uh, that would possibly be I, – I just wanted to p- contribute my two cents, something from a completely different perspective you don't hear every day in the yeah. MRA uh, realm. <laughs> hey, I've got a beautiful 26-year-old daughter. What? Without a control. <laughs> a lot of guys, yeah, a lot of the guys don't even uh, – haven't even been married. They're a lot younger. Or they don't have uh, kids or certainly not adult daughters for that matter. So. Yeah. I just thought that might be valuable. Well, uh, I I wish you luck. I hope that that you can maybe convince her to snap out of it. <laughs> well, here's well, here's maybe a question. Does does she have a uh maybe a kind of an adult conception or maybe she's at an age where she's starting to realize that her expectations are not actually in line with reality? I guess I don't know. She's so uh, immersed in her culture, this nightlife. It seems to be the the very most important thing to her, quote, having fun, unquote, and partying, as she puts it. And uh, the Jersey going... Shore thing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I, yeah. I would... You know, every time somebody watches that show, a book commits suicide. <laughs> 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 But sure, I mean she's just out of, out of control, just different geography. She's not in New Jersey; she's in Texas and uh, living the high life. But it, the bill's going to come in for that someday too. You know, it's going to oh, wreck her true. health. Yeah. Well, and, she's she's 26. She's probably got four or five years left, and uh, she will be cooked. Her goose will be cooked. Does she have any kids? No, no. Amazingly, somehow she's managed. I've heard rumors that she had abortions, though. I don't well, know. I you try, try to confront her with it. She won't admit to it. Uh, not to me, at least. So that's uh, unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mark. Well, so, thanks. Thanks very much for calling. Oh well, yes. I uh, I, I uh, certainly appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to. To my uh, to uh, my perspective on things, appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, so um, 
I have almost run out of stuff to say, and I don't think we're going to take any more callers, but uh, I guess we might take a, a few. If anybody calls in immediately in the next few minutes, uh, 310-388-9709. Okay, we're back, and uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And Typhon, uh, I believe, wants to talk a little bit about the Apex Jewel Mail. Uh, Typhon, you're on the air again. Hi, John. Thanks for bringing me back on. Um, yeah, I uh, presented on YouTube on my channel. Uh, can I plug my channel? You can. Of course. <laughs> it's uh, Gender Attic, which is um, a portmanteau of gender and erratic. And it's on uh, YouTube, and it's called uh, Patriarchy 1.0 in the Apexual. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to do a brief rundown, because um, uh, you guys were talking. Th I think you were referencing it slightly in one of your videos, uh, Girl yeah. uh, Karen. And also, there, I think there are some references today. Um, apexuality is basically taking your gender identity from your place in a hierarchy rather than either your maleness, the experience of being male or your relationship with yourself or other males or your father. So it's a, it's essentially, I don't even want to call it a male identity. It's just an apexual identity. You just You basically are the hierarchy. And without the hierarchy, you, you don't even exist as a human being. And uh, I had a lot of um, people commenting and saying that women also are part of the hierarchy and they, they compete as well. But the difference is that, that men take their gender identity from the hierarchy. Women don't take their gender identity from the hierarchy. If you take a woman out of the hierarchy, she's still, she's still a woman. If you take a man out of the hierarchy, he's nothing. This is and really what he needs to exist as a, as a Men have to trust identity. He ceases to identity. exist. He ceases to exist yes, as I anything. That. He, just, he just falls into a hole of, of essentially shame. Yeah, and, he's one uh, of the homeless people that we don't look in the eye, homeless men. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. it's it's really um, because men have to construct their identity. They have to um, they have to build it around themselves. Yeah. They, they don't just get it. But I think uh, this might be an opportunity. I hope that it's an opportunity because it's really like what feminism has done is really laid bare the bones of this system and the whole concept of apexuality, like taking your gender identity from your position in the hierarchy. Before, you could say that's a male identity because women weren't in the hierarchy, but now they're in the hierarchy, so it's no longer an exclusively male identity. But one, so thing, that that I've, one thing that I've found uh, with women within the hierarchy, um, I, I, as far as politicians go, is I, I've I have heard several female politicians say, you know, well I'm I'm here to uh, help women. I'm here to you know look after the interests of women. I'm here to make sure women get a fair shake. Um, and and you never see that with men. The closest thing no, I saw that with was with um, that one independent guy in Canada, Chuck. Um, Oh, he he ran after his son got killed or something, and mm -hmm. he was sort of a uh, uh, he he was sort of there for the 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 little guy. He was there for the the middle class man. He was there for the working class man, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, you don't see somebody just there for men. You never men hear. Are, uh, no, of course not, because men aren't thing. supposed to be. Men, there is no social value in taking care of men. There's only social value in taking care of women, and men must create their social value by stepping in to fulfill that role of taking care of somebody else, never themselves, though. I think it's part of the, the, the own group preference that women have, though. I think that part of the reason that um, that women have been able to get so out of control and, and other women, even the ones who make wise choices in their lives and are responsible... Um, seem to just be okay defending that and say, well, you know, you sh we shouldn't hold it against her or, you know, we shouldn't shame her or we shouldn't, you know, or we shouldn't, her life shouldn't be difficult even though she's done all of these things, these these foolish things. Um, I think this this is own group preference at work, seeking consensus, right? And mm -hmm. And all the outliers bend a little to, you know, adjust to the, the, Great, you know, to everybody adjusts 
to keep every as many women in the fold as possible. possible. Right? People, yeah, but people think that women are more compassionate, more consen- consensus, consensus building. But I, what I think is actually happening is that they're more like warlords jockeying for position, and they all know that they can do significant amounts of damage emotionally. So they're all in sort of a stalemate eyeing each other uh, have, after having uh, partitioned or chewed up a territory, um, well, whereas men, be, whereas men, when uh, when be at, without that that personal identity, they're not interested in in creating an emotional territory, so they can actually work together cooperatively for a common goal because they don't they aren't carrying that baggage of I need to. Um, I guess honor my femaleness. My femaleness requires respect. Well, and so they, they aren't as self-interested either. Um, as as far as like I'm I'm sure men can be egotistical and and prideful and and get their backs up when they feel like they've been, um, you know, uh, slighted. But um, there's there's really when a man relates to other men. Right, he's relating to other men in his group, in his military unit, in his church, in his political party, you know, in but not just all men. And I think women have this ability to even, you know, the wise ones who make the wise choices have this ability to say, well, you know, if I was stuck with three kids by three different dads, I'd want welfare benefits too. So, you know, it, it's sort of almost like they they will just sort of be more accepting, I think, in, in a lot of ways of bad behavior of other women, um, as long as it's not uh, behavior that they want to police. Well, there um, is a, I think there's a YouTube Melanie. channel who who, who uh, did a series of videos, uh, Man, Woman, Myth, who coined, I believe coined the term X-chromosome racism to describe this in-group and out-group preference between men and women. And I think it's a really useful piece of terminology um, because we look well, at I think this, this atavist. Go ahead. I think it's a biological preference. I, I think that I, from that that research piece that I that I read, I think because of men's roles, right? When your role for the last however many million years is to protect women from other men and kill other men in order to do that and compete against other men to prove that you're worthy of mating and to you you can't just automatically have a bias in favor of your gender. The, no. the only problem um, I have is how they fighting with the assholes down the valley when they attack your village and you know and kill all your women. Um, Karen, the, the problem I have with the evil psych is I think it's really it's it's defeatist almost. It's like this is the way it's going to be and this is the way it's always going to be. Um, and the, the thing is, is yeah, you have to you you have to work against it. But I think that so many people have so many gut reactions to certain things, like the hitting a girl. Um, mm-hmm. How we think no, that agree. violence against women is the biggest problem ever, when it's actually, as far as violence goes, it's Minor. the smallest one we have. And yet, it's the one <laughs> yeah, we devote okay. most resources to. And and at the same time, it's the one that everybody thinks we're not paying enough attention to. Oh no, I totally well, agree with the bias. I just. I, I disagree that it's 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 something biological that we can't change. And maybe maybe even if it like is biological, optimism. we can still yeah. act against it. This is the other thing, thing is that see. even the I understand the the um, maybe aversion to look at the evolutionary psychology and and say well if we're wired this way, maybe that means this can't be changed. Um, I think there's a component that there's a predisposition, but you know, in the same way as I have, as does everybody, a predisposition to food that is very high in carbohydrates and sugar because of the evolutionary history of, of you know, bipedal life forms eating this kind of food, I can still moderate my consumption of fat and sugar so that I don't become a big slab of flab. <laughs> but there's another component that's going to force a moderation on, on the the feminization of the society as it sort of gets farther and farther out of whack is that our our society can't continue to sustain this model as it becomes more pronounced and escalated. And you're going to see um, the, the catastrophic collapse of social institutions and financial institutions, and there will be 
the economic necessity to find a new model uh, that that corrects this, that provides a viable model for people to go back to having families again or, or have an equitable life between men and women. So even though there is that disposition from an evolutionary psychology point of view, it's not the only arbiter of that of the problem. Well, we ha- we can only take it as far as we can afford to. It's like, um, like I've often described when I was when I was watching daytime TV still, and I used to watch this show till death do us part, and uh, where these people would get themselves in just horrible, like wealthy people, upper middle class people, and they get themselves in horrible, horrible debt, where you know the the advisor would take them aside and say, it's going to take you, you know, 36 years to pay off this debt if you spend every penny that you have, right? Um, so if you only make the minimum payments or whatever, right? And so, but you, I would see these women <clears throat> shopping, and, like, their their four-year-old has 130 dresses, and 75 of them still have the tags on, and they're outgrown, and I'm thinking, how? Why are people doing this? And it's it's really this instinct for consumption um, that that grew in us when we didn't know when our next meal was coming from, when we didn't know whether the next season was going to be a lean season. You you got as much as you could while you could, right? But back then, the famine came two or three years later, right? And and you were pre- yeah. but at the same time, you didn't have these huge credit cards, you didn't have lines of credit, you didn't have banks willing to lend you easy money, you weren't able to spend money you didn't have. And so now the famine never comes until you're so far in debt that there's no way to dig yourself out. And I think Well, I mean, greed serves us very well in the neolithic society. It's it's just an instinct for consumption. Yeah. I wonder how much of that is um, trying to fulfill a psychological need, though. That they that they really had didn't get fulfilled when they were kids. I don't know. She just like the one woman. She just says, "I just see them and they're nice, and I have to buy them." And it sounds like you addictive know, behavior. Yeah, but it's it's also just somebody just acting on their impulses and, mm-hmm. uh, well, and not infant, thinking about that's what they're doing. How an infant behaves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, exactly. Uh, and that's that's really what I when when we look at sort of these. Uh, these impulsive ways that we're, you know, going about <clears throat> financing this society right now, getting ourselves into hawk to foreign countries, uh, expanding the debt, um, you know, all of that, not not to invest, because way back when, if, if a government borrowed money, it was, they were going to borrow money for a capital project that was going to produce a return on that investment. And are we you know, talking about like, Canada right now? Because I think we're pr- doing pretty well, aren't we? We are now, but there are reasons for that. You know, we we're pretty. But you look at you look at the states, right? You look at yeah, Greece. Yeah. You look at Sweden. You look at you know Denmark. You look at all these countries that that are are just Denmark. When I went there 25 years ago, uh, the tax burden on citizens was 77 cents on every dollar. Every dollar they earned, they paid out seventy cents in all the various taxes. <laughs> well, I, I've heard that Greece is on the verge of decoupling their economy from the from the e, from the European Union, uh, and as much as that's going to create a short-term catastrophe for them in their economy, not that they haven't already suffered an incredible catastrophe. In decoupling themselves from this international system of perpetually spiraling debt, they really free themselves as a nation to be able to recover, to be able to grow and and get back to something rational. Um, if if they can so, actually uh, have the political will to to get back to something rational and not just yeah, it also may be that the rest and of then the... spend 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 again. I mean, yeah, it also might be a right? totally the... irrational system. Well, it's we're we're spending money we don't have just to get by. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're spending money you don't have to buy an asset that appreciates, then that's cool. But mm-hmm. when you're spending money you don't have just to buy groceries, that's a serious issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or you're borrowing more money to pay your credit card debt. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Just the other thing that occurs to me is that if Greece does attempt to decouple itself from the EU. 
you may see the rest of the union uh, imposing military action against them to say, no, 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 you have to get back in line and pay these debts. Well, that would be some serious stuff. May, I don't know. May I, I don't know whether that's going to happen, but... Yeah, go ahead, James. All right. Uh... Right, right now, Greece is experiencing a whole lot of privatization, uh, whereas they had a um, uh, social run of uh, utilities and things of that nature before. There's a lot of private industry uh, from many countries coming in, swooping in, and buying up uh, their land, their uh, their industry, uh, all of their uh, utilities, which which means things like electricity, uh, stuff like that, is now being privatized, um, and in the hands of um, people that aren't Grecian. Foreign interests, yeah. So you're so even if. Uh, Greece attempts to decouple, those uh, foreign interests are going to have enough power through their private corporations uh, to bring Greece to its knees. There will not be a need for any kind of military action in that case. They'll, they'll simply start turning off the lights, so to speak. Huh. And that, that, will, that, that will bring Greece back in line with with the uh, EU system. Well, yeah, that's unfortunate. Even, I, I recognize even that, if, but it's, it's even if they did begin to uh, recover um, uh, with within the EU system, uh, the rest of it's going to fall like a stack of dominoes. Now, you might look at Greece and say, "Well, that's only a very small percentage of the total." total uh, EU's economy, but right now uh, you've got the UK and um, and Germany pretty much floating the boat over there in, in Europe, and how long is that going to last when, when you're looking at uh, Spain having issues, Portugal's economy is going down the tubes, uh, things of that nature. It, it's just a stack of dominoes waiting to fall, and, and even if you're only looking at 2% here or 4% there, uh, that stuff adds up, and when you look at world markets, a 20% decrease in in the EU's buying power uh, would have a huge impact worldwide. And you're still looking at the collapse of individual countries in that case. It's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Wow, this is. It is a little sobering. It's a little chilling, to be honest. Well, and here I was hoping Japan would collapse and sound the, the real warning. Well, I wasn't hoping, but you know what I mean, before Canada or the U.S. does. So. No, no, I think we're all it's going to take is – oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think we're looking at international denial of reality right now. Um, yeah. And there will be denial until it's so – they will deny it until it's so bad that it basically leaks through the cracks and that, that there actually isn't the ability to deny it. It's so screamingly obvious. But we're a little ways off there, and it's going to get worse. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I'm, I, I'd give it another another 10 years of floating. That's assuming Germany uh, remains cooperative, and uh, Germany's even had some internal rumblings itself um, as far as their own financial uh, stability is concerned. They're seriously considering going back to the Deutschmark. Uh, they're sick and tired of of throwing their hard-earned cash into the European Union in an attempt to bail out people who uh, retire at the age of 55 and want all these social benefits. Well, this is the thing. I think everybody has uh, sort of a willingness to help people who are working hard, you know. But it, it, it when when you got people that are just you know I just wanna I wanna retire early and sit on my butt and collect benefits, yeah, I can see where there would be some serious resentment. Mm 
Well, keep, keep in mind that that was that was the Grecian model for for a couple generations. Uh, yeah. People would be able to retire at the age of 55 and and uh, receive a ton of benefits uh, above and beyond that. Um, it didn't work for them because it starts stacking up. Uh, we're experiencing the same issues here in the U.S. when we when we look at individual cities actually threatening bankruptcy because the Contracts they signed for pensions uh, 30 years ago are now catching up to them and kicking them in the ass. Uh, oh, definitely. Canada they, pension they plan can't, is they can't broke afford it. I might retire. So, you know, any, uh, any, the fact that we have a diminishing generation, like we go from – We from, go from the pyramid, the triangle being wide at the base to the triangle being on its point. Yeah, and and it's uh, it's completely non-viable. The only way to do it is to indebt your grandchildren, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and without their volition, without their consent. And at what point do does the society turn around and, and raise up a middle finger and say, no, nope, not paying? Well, I think we're gonna. What's gonna have to happen is, is countries are gonna start having to default on their debts. Well, yeah. I don't think it's that they're going to start. I think it is that they are. They're, they're just going to yeah, say, well, I, I really we're not paying so. it, we're not paying it back, we're not paying the interest, we're not paying anything. Well, the, uh, there, there's a relatively large sector of young people inside uh, Greece right now who are so disenfranchised um, that, that it's not even funny. Uh, if you if you really take a look at what's going on over there, it's it's going to get ugly. It's going to get real ugly over the next few years. Uh, most of the people that uh, were rioting in the streets on a regular basis uh, were a little bit older. Uh, those that knew that they were pretty much in in line and had already paid in to the system and were not going to get anything back. Uh, and now we're looking at. Um, we're looking at all these young people over there who goes, well, there's no system for us anyway. Why are we even? Why do you, Why are we even going to try? And yeah. to tell you the truth, I I see a lot of these same parallels with uh, with what's happening in the U.S., where we at best have another 30 years or so of um, uh, entitlements before. The, the whole thing starts to collapse. Uh, why, why do you think one of the one of the things on the agenda in, in both parties has been talking about entitlement reform, entitlement reform? It's because they know what's going to happen in, in about 30 years. Uh, it's going it, to get massive want enough. Their yeah, the, vote, the voters want their entitlements. And what, once again, this I think all all of what we've talked about here draws right back to the original blue pill idea that um, uh, the individual is, is owed something. We, we've, got a, we've got a society of grasshoppers and not enough ants. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Well, when, that when you reward the grasshoppers and you punish the ants, what do you expect? Well, the oh, yeah. result Artists. is fun. Uh, having a group of people that put more into the system than they take out. Part of the, the what I see as the new economy is almost a system designed to collapse every 12 to 18 months. And with each semi-collapse, with each little crisis, and I call them little crises, where there has to be a refunding, a refinancing, where the society goes deeper into debt, pr prints more money to offset the existing debt or, or pay some portion of it. And in doing so, not just there is a transfer of, of money from the public or you know to the bankers to the central banking system, but there is a restructuring of, of, the, of the labor market, of the job market, to a service-based economy. Because in a collapsing economy, you lose production, you lose innovation. So what's left are administrative service type jobs, which traditionally and even now are the jobs occupied by women. So we have this transfer of debt 
from irresponsible financial practices at the top tier of the banking system onto the public, so the public carries that debt, and then on the general population, the manufacture, the creation of, of busy work jobs for one demographic, the one that is everybody is always the go-to, I'm going to help empower women. Uh, yeah, and you get and, and then, increasingly. But then when, in order for women to have jobs, you have costs attached to that, right? Of course you do. Yeah, and that's that subsidized daycare that's and all of that, problem. right? Maternity leave. The fact and all that you don't have manufacturing and that you don't have innovation because the education system is so degraded now, uh, so that the the STEM jobs are increasingly uh, increasingly smaller and smaller and smaller segment of the economic pie. Um, this promotes a system that is designed to rise and collapse on a on about a two year cycle. It's, I don't so, know. It's just it's just crazy. I, I just I don't understand the I don't understand the reasoning of government. It's like in that article, uh Chateau Hartiste, you know, says uh stop paying women to pump out broods of bastards. You only get more of what you paid for. You know, and yeah. it's a harsh way to say it. You know, to stop well, I think, supporting I single think mothers. the answer, as, as brutal as it is, is, is this system can't continue. Yeah, no, it, it can't really can't. At a, at a macroeconomic level. And the collapse is going to be really ugly. It's going to be nasty. I expect that there's going to be um, violence and, and public convulsion. And, um, you know, certainly the, the opposite of what I want. Um, but what comes out of that on the other side hopefully is a viable system. What that system will be, how it will work, I, I don't have the foresight to know, but um, the system is is not is is so very obviously not viable right now that I would rather the collapse come sooner than later because the later it is, the worse it's going to be. Yeah, the, the longer it goes, the more likely we're going to all be living under some form of extreme patriarchy. Well, I see possibly the emergence of the warlord model of, of regional government again. Yeah. So. No, now well, that I've well, it everybody could up. Be like Afghanistan. <laughs> the problem with extreme patriarchy is it it costs a lot in male lives. Oh, it does. It does. And it's, and it it's, costs. It's a, basically a meat grinder for men. Oh yeah. It, it's no fun for women. It's definitely no fun for men. It's no fun for anyone. No. But if I could interject and maybe bring it back to the topic that we, we talked about, uh, I think this, uh, I mean, this economic problems, again, maybe I'm going with the uh, the positivity and um, and feminism gives men an opportunity to re reconsider how they're going to define themselves, if they want to define themselves by their paycheck or their status in a hierarchy, if they want to find something new to define themselves by. I think well, that's I think, probably. I think they, they've encouraged men to do that simply because they've made uh, the the means of defining yourself by your paycheck or by your status or by your uh, family status and all that just completely, completely onerous. Um, they, it's they've impossible. turned those non choices. Now I was thinking about that. It's just like um, today I was talking to somebody on the men's Reddit. And he doesn't have a problem with the fact that men don't have a presumption of, of, of shared custody. And I was thinking about that, and I was saying, dude, you shouldn't have children if you don't have a problem with that. You are not father material. Any yeah. man who is father material should have a serious problem with that. So oh, yeah. essentially we've got a system that says, oh, the doofuses that want to, you know, <laughs> they would rather be uh, smoking and drinking than taking care of their children because they don't really care if, have shared custody, these guys aren't being scared off. So they're the ones having children. And the men yeah. who actually care about their kids are being scared but off see, of having them. That to me is very, very sad because even though these guys are going to participate in the reproductive game um, and, and thinking that they're just going to coast along, they will be extorted for their money for choices that they don't have a choice over. So they're saying, well, I, I don't have any money so they can't take it from me. Well, we do have debtors' prisons now, um, although we're not supposed to. Yeah, and we have imputed income and all that nice stuff. Yeah, so we can't you'll make get money your income. You. You we'll get your income. Basically, what you're saying is, I'm, I'm prepared 
to, by my sloppy lack of making a, a, a logical choice in reproduction, I'm prepared to have the system force me out of the economy so that if I actually have an income, it has to be under the, under the, under the table. And that's a terrible choice to make, even if it's a choice made by omission. Uh, and guys like this, not only are they not father material, they're not, they're not adult material. They're not citizen material. Yeah. Well, the the frustrating thing is that is that we are losing so many people, uh, as so much, so many people with a sense of obligation to society. And I, frankly, I mean, there's there's obligation and there's obligation, and you have to have some sense of obligation to society, some sense of owing something to someone other than yourself. You know, I owe it to my neighbor you know, to not let my dog crap on his lawn or whatever. You owe it, you owe, you, you want to put something in, not just take out, right, and not just look mm-hmm. after yourself, just yourself. And and we're losing those people because we've made all of those contributions completely meaningless to them. Um, and well, we, we want we've made them talk to them. What we've done is we've... Agents, and they, they've gladly become free agents. They, 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 they jumped at the chance to be free agents, and we've forced men to become free agents. Well, we never survive. really made women free agents because women have always had the state backing them up. But they don't have um, any obligations to anyone. They can switch teams anytime they want. They can demand a high paycheck. They're they're like the hockey player who only has to play for however many games he gets his paycheck, then he goes on to the next team. Yeah. For a higher paycheck. You know, they they, they don't, well, they don't one, owe anything to anyone. It's a one sided contract. Yeah. You know, and men are just walking and, uh, away from the contract altogether. Well, I, I, I think that the logical, and as, as much as it's destructive to society for men to do this, um, it's incredibly destructive, the way the rules are set up right now, the way the cultural moors are, and the way that the laws are set up, is it is totally irrational for a oh, man to look at the rest of society as if he has any obligation to it. It's oh, irrational. Yeah, no, you can't blame him. Um, and it is a rational choice, it's a logical choice and an ethical one to say, not that I'm going to go and take this society for a ride and extract everything that I can out of it, I don't think that's um, an ethical view, but that men are going to say, I'm going to take care of myself and the rest of you are on your own. That, oh, totally. to me, is, is that's the environment that we have created with our system as it is now. And until we disincentivize that viewpoint and re-incentivize men to have a participatory role where they are looking out for other people, where it's not just that we're going to try to shame them to get back on the treadmill, but we actually say, listen, if you do this, we're going to treat you like a reasonable human being. We're going to give you human rights and prestige and so on. Until our society as a whole is ready to do that, we're not going to see an economic recovery. We're not going to see men turning around the marriage strike and wanting to go have families again or pursue high-pressure careers or do anything that is to benefit anybody but themselves. And it's tragic, but that's what we've incentivized. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it really is. It, it's, it's, it's a choice. It's a choice that they have to make. I think it's, it's the choice that I would want my sons to make until things get better. You know, yeah. as much as I would really love for them to, your own. Be have fa- to, to have families and to have kids of their own and to, to you know, have fulfilling well, lives. If men are feeling uh, this environment, I don't wish that for them. Um, uh, Gene, are you going to say something? Yeah, yeah, I was just... Uh, I, uh, what, what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, men, men pretty much going their own way and, and looking out for themselves and uh, I'll tell you right now, uh, there, there's people on both sides of the political spectrum uh, who want to have nothing to do with that one side because uh, they know that um, their biggest con- constituency will not be taken care of, and the other side because they know that uh, uh, the financial collapse that would invariably ensue if enough men opted out would destroy them. And that's one of the reasons why uh, you see social conservatives on one side screaming, don't go, (laughs) 
<laughs> get married, have Be kids, man, man yeah. up, do the right thing, and shame, you've got shame, shame. you've got right, and you've got the other side going shame, shame, shame. You're you're not uh, you're not a, a contributor. You're not a team player, and, yeah, and, and you and obviously don't. hate women if 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 you can't stand to marry one. Oh what's, yeah, what's really it, interesting and it's, about this. Women should have sexual freedom, but men should have to marry women. Well, what's really interesting about this is they don't. Oops, sorry. It's that they go don't ahead. seem no, go ahead. To, to recognize. Like both sides are shaming men, shaming, shaming, shaming. And um, I read once of a, about a dog trainer, or he, she mentioned that when you um, punish dogs, when you try to use negative reinforcement, it shuts them down. And, oops. Uh, not to, but what I'm saying is that both sides are now shaming men. They're both using negative reinforcement with absolutely nothing positive. So it's, what's going to happen? They're trying to shame them into something gonna, that has nothing positive. Men are going to have to start developing a positive identity that relates to neither side. Oh, totally. They're going to be oh, forced into it. I mean, it's 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 necessary to to remain sane as a man in this yeah. society. To remain sane and capable of forming rational thoughts, it is necessary to disconnect from social approval. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that, that's that's Good. true. But but I, I do want to make make sure we we stay on the uh, the right uh, sheet of music here and, and warn against the idea of nihilism in its entirety because that's what we're headed towards. Um, <laughs> if you have yeah, enough no, disincentivized, if you have enough disincentivized I, young men who have not ingested the red pill, that's exactly where it's headed. Uh, for those that have ingested the red pill, they they understand that there's uh, certain certain boundaries that they need to control their their rage to some extent. But a lot of these young men, what, what are they going to do? Yeah, uh, a lot of these young men, what are, what are they going to do? Well, well he, 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 no, he doesn't even know what he's mad at. He's just mad. Oh, yeah. You, if you, <laughs> you're going to have generations of young guys behaving like they behaved in the London riots last year. Oh, I can I can completely see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're looking at a very realistic uh, culture among young men at that point. And I'll tell you what, that, that provides... The perfect ammunition uh, to to whom we consider our enemies. Um, all, all of a sudden, you've got you've made the problem. Uh, they've made the problem. Uh, I, I a bunch of young men who are disenfranchised, pissed off, and lashing out against the world. But, uh, but we're only and now look they're at... going to offer the solution, and their solution is going to be all those wonderful, horrible things we've been hearing about for so long. It, it's yeah, the a, solution it's a, is going to be very it's going to be a brutal perfect, attack on men. Well, because, because nobody's going to even strategy. bother. Nobody's going to even bother looking for what they're reacting to because men don't react, they act. Yeah. Right? They're only going to look it's at the rest and the acting out. Yeah, they're but not the going to look at the causes until men it is. Don't need but a the reason. thing is, you can only you can only suppress it so long, and then the cost prevents you from continuing to suppress it, and you have to look at the sources of this problem, which is the continued disenfranchisement, the elevation of one sexual demographic over another, the continued affirmative action in the educational system, despite the fact that females are 60 to 65 percent of graduates, we still have female favoring incentivization in the education system. So. We have to look at this stuff, and the cost of not looking at it goes up the longer we wait. I, I absolutely agree with that, and I, like I stated last week, uh, I don't think we're here to, to. I don't think we're here to stop uh, a collapse. I think we're only here to attempt to soften the hammer blow as much as we possibly can. Uh, because oh, yeah, when, we, when we look at the fiscal condition of of some of the some of the largest uh, countries in the world, when we consider uh, that they're already 
rumblings about moving away from the idea of the petrodollar. Uh, and when we look at the way that all these young men are being disenfranchised in the UK, in Canada, the US, uh, Australia, um, <laughs> education, in what we do, getting it out there, um, is going to be key to helping to rebuild something of value. Oh, I hope it turns out that way. I think it will. I think that the, the thing is that things don't collapse until there's something to replace them. And if you want to see what's going to replace true. it, you look at what's ostracized, what's uh, declared a hate group, what's uh, what's um, not allowed in the public light, and that usually is what's end, what ends up replacing it. I mean, look yeah, at well, the, the, the yeah. look at the Roman Empire. That'll the Roman Empire didn't fall until Christianity replaced what came before it. Re- so that'll the, uh, be us the, stepping the in to uh, provide a new framework. One can guess, only hope. Yeah. Or uh, a philosophy based on some of the stuff that that uh, men's rights movement talks about. Yeah. Okay. But the, I don't think <laughs> I don't think Rome would have fallen until people just forgot about it. You just didn't care anymore. Well, you know what? And they, Typhon, I'm delighted as as always. I'm delighted to steal your ideas, um, and I'm really <laughs> glad of this one. Because that is a bit of a positive note, because we are, this movement is right now the de facto most hated movement, I, I would say. So uh, that's actually very good news. It's very good news <laughs> that we're on the right track and we can provide some kind of framework um, in the future that will actually be a viable framework. We just have to um, get out the chalkboard and design it and build it. Mm-hmm. And hopefully well, the idea is men will have some say. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe men will have some emotional franchisement this time around. That would be cool. Huh. Okay. Well, I think we're just we're just about out of time, everybody. So uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Girl Rights What Karen to remind all our listeners that there's something that we want them to take. We've been talking about the blue version of this product. Um, I just want to uh, to let y'all know you got you got to take that pill. It, it's it's the bright red candy colored pill. Take the red pill. Fantastic. 